number three. Let's go ahead and get our notes out. Get your pens out. Open your Bibles to Revelations chapter number three. Revelations chapter number three. All right, we left off. We're on Roman numeral three. I don't know if they're teaching kids that in school anymore, are they? Are they teaching uh, Roman numerals in school anymore, Miss Julia? They taught me that in elementary. We had to add, divide, multiply with Roman numerals. I don't know if that's because we're in a Christian school. That's part of the Abeka curriculum, but... uh, uh, anyways, I, I've talked to some people uh, not too long ago that don't even know uh, what Roman numerals are. But anyways, we're on Roman numeral uh, uh, under, we're under uh, chastisement. No, we're under challenge. We're on challenge. Amen. I like to go back, don't you? Amen. We talked about, what church are we talking about? It's the last church, okay? And uh, what's interesting, before we get started... I don't know if you've got a ribbon in your Bible, but go ahead and uh, keep your finger there and turn over to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I want you to look at something before we get into started. And the reason why chapter 2 and 3 are uh, letters to the church, and so let's look at Thessalonians. This is not in your notes, but if you want to go ahead and write them right next to challenge there in that column there, you can. It's 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 1 through 3. I want you to see something here that's interesting. This is going to help you. Are you there? All right. The Bible says in verse number one, it says, Now we beseech you, uh, brethren, by the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. By what? By the coming of the Lord Jesus. Now this is after the Lord already arose into heaven. Remember, that happened in Acts And now these are the letters to the churches. And uh, the Lord rose into heaven before the church actually, the church was instituted by Jesus and his disciples. But uh, Paul and them didn't start the church at uh, uh, Thessalonica until after all of that, okay? And so they're talking about what? The second coming. Is that not what they're talking about? Yes, it is. All right. So he says, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. Amen. Now, won't that be a glorious time? It sure will. Now, read on with me. It says in verse 2, that you be not soon, what? Shaken in mind or be troubled, uh, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letters as, as from us as that the day of Christ is at hand. Now, one thing that I've taught you, uh, church, uh, is that the day of Christ and the day of the Lord are the same day. Now, who remembers what day is that? Go ahead. It's the rapture. Amen. The day of Christ is for the saints, and the day of the Lord is for, that begins the what? Tribulation. So if the rapture starts, that's one day. And, and uh, you know, but he's talking to the church. He says the day of the Christ is at hand. That's talking about the raptures at hand. Now, in Revelations chapter 2 and 3, these are letters to the churches, and he's trying to ex- explain things to the church, isn't he, before he talks about what? The rapture. The rapture happens after the church, am I right? Yes, so Revelations chapter 4 at the beginning is the rapture. You say, well, what does this have to do? It does have to do with this. So look at verse number 3. It says, let no man deceive you by any means. Well, we have that going on today, don't we? It's hard to find a church and or a pastor that wants to teach and preach the truth about God's word. You'll bring a lot more people in if you just be a good orator. Amen. I've talked to visitors, and uh, you know they 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 uh, they say, "Boy, you don't you preach the Bible." Praise God. That's what we're going to continue to do. Amen. And uh, I'll tell you, the church is one pastor away from apostasy. I'm just being honest. Uh, if the man behind the pulpit uh, doesn't stay right with God and stick to the book, uh, then neither will the church. Okay. And so it is important uh, that we don't let no man deceive us. Now you say, preacher, I'm so glad that you teach. Uh, no, uh, you should you should be glad that we teach as a church, but I teach in a way uh, where you should be knowing as much as I do. 
Because you're supposed to be ready to give an answer to all man, to every man at all time, not just me. Okay, and so this is what we pride ourselves in. I've just seen these books. Uh, you'll see this book here. This is actually college curriculum. And I've seen Brother Rick, uh, one of his uh, college students for, that they have at their school there. And uh, they posted they were studying their final semester uh, to graduate at his college. He didn't have the revelation. He had evidence manuscript uh, uh, book, which I have, which I'd like to go through here at the church. But anyways, he's just finishing that up. And uh, same book. So guess what? You are being taught on a college level, but in a way where you can understand it as a layperson. So you're getting everything you would get as a pastor. Now what are you going to do with it? All right, now look at this verse number three. Let no man deceive you by any means. That's why we want to learn at that level. For that the day shall not come, now pay attention, except... Except, now if you, uh, if you look at your Bible, did you see that that day shall not come is an italicized? Okay, so that means that that was added for you to help understand. Now, let me help you with this. The actual Greek and Hebrew, uh, we don't even know. We can't even speak. Those are lost languages. That means that their language was so deep. We're not smarter. We're dumber. We couldn't even comprehend the depth. And so even though this is at the pinnacle of English depth back in 1600s, that still is nothing compared to the original Hebrew and Greek. Can you imagine, wait a minute, Adam came up with names. When's the last time you did that? Okay, he came up with them. He didn't go to a book and say, oh, lion, that's a good one. Are you with me? Hmm, I'll do the, you know, a wolf. You know, now think about what those were in uh, Hebrew. Hmm. Deep. Now, now if you think about the depth of the actual word of God in Greek and Hebrew, which we have the actual word of God in, in English, we couldn't even comprehend the depth of the Greek and Hebrew. Can you imagine that? One day we'll be able to actually understand and see it. Won't that be great? No, you know what? Actually, I'll get to see Jesus, so it won't matter. Will <laughs> Amen. All right, so look at it. it. says, For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that the, men of, uh, the man of sin be revealed and the son of perdition. Now, what is the, it says there, except there come a falling away first. Now, this is important with these letters because we've came to the last letter and we've seen a church where the Bible says, and we've read, that Jesus stands outside the church and he calls it the church of of the Laodiceans, meaning that it's worldly and there's a great falling away that's going to happen before the rapture comes. Now, if you go back to verse number 1, it says, Now we beseech you or beg you, brethren, by the coming of the Lord. Now, you know what he's saying? There is going to be judgment. And judgment is coming. Now, look around, church. This is our church. Look around. There's a lot of open pews. It's not because we lack in teaching. It's not because we lack in preaching about Jesus Christ. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with a great falling away. Now, I'm just trying to help you understand something because we're getting close to chapter 4 and so is our time. I remember uh, when you'd put on uh, Facebook, or well, it wasn't a Facebook when I was young, but if you put it on your billboard, that was Facebook. Uh, yeah, isn't that funny? You put it on billboard. You know, you didn't. You remember when they used to put up uh, little posters at grocery stores, and that would draw people to a tent revival. Or if you said you were doing VBS, I mean, everybody in town found out because they all went to Butchery's or Albertsons or Safeway or whatever store. We had Butchery's. Isn't that a funny name? They have Butchery's here. I used to think it was butteries, remember? <laughs> Amen. But anyways, you could go put it at the store and help most of the town would know. You know, now we got Facebook where everybody sees, but they all ignore. Now, I remember you put you were going to study Revelation, the whole town would show up. Now we study Revelation and the church don't tell anybody. And even if you did, nobody gives a rip. You tell people that the rapture draweth nigh and they're just like, whatever. Rap what? 
That's a shame, isn't it? Let me ask you this. Aren't we here? For that the day shall not come except there come a falling away first. Now you understand something. We already see the evidence in the church. We do. Yeah. Oh yeah, we we've always had an excuse. I I, I think that even without COVID, there's been there was an excuse. Pre pre COVID, we still had excuse. You know, uh, a lot of people say, "Well, I was there on Sunday. I don't need to come on Wednesday." God bless. Uh, that's not what the Bible says. It says, "Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together." And now, assembling together means being at church, not being at live stream. So I was just uh, visiting with someone about that earlier. Uh, just uh, live stream actually puts a constraint on your preacher, uh, whereas we can't really teach and get the church involved so that's really hard it is hard to do live stream because then I can't get the people that actually want to assemble to be a part because then everyone have to have a mic just so you can feel like you're a part well that's not how it's that's not how it's supposed to be so uh, believe me I am praying about not doing live stream on Wednesday so we can actually have a teaching class that we can have freedom I've got to have freedom to teach now if you want to come here teaching you got to be assembled at the church that's what the Bible says and you say oh preacher I, that's that's not we just don't feel like coming you know we always got an excuse I just shared this with my nephew today I says man it's been a long time since I've seen from you or heard from you and we used to talk on a weekly basis this is my little brother's old oldest boy love him to death got a good heart and he goes yeah I know I've been extremely busy and I says yeah we'll make ourselves busy doing whatever we want to do and I says but you'll make time for other things I said I've texted you and you haven't texted me back we'll make time for he goes you sound like my dad I said well that sounds like good advice maybe you're gonna probably be sharing that one day right OJ isn't that how it works? Amen. Amen. I'm telling you that there is a great falling away. And notice what happens after the falling away. Uh, the, the falling away, what happens after that? The rapture happens. And then what happens? Then guess what happens right after that? The Antichrist is revealed. Let's go back to Revelations. You say, preacher, why did you bring that up? Well, because of the fact that we're looking at a church here that doesn't have Jesus in it, and I really think that this letter has more impact for the church right now, more so than most of the other letters, because I believe that most churches today don't have Jesus present on the inside. They have him on the outside looking in. Because church has become an entertainment for the people and not a lifting up of Jesus Christ like it's supposed to be. Worship is the preaching and convicting power of, the Bible calls it foolishness of preaching. I said that to somebody the other day, and they laughed, and they looked at me funny, and they go, why do they call it the foolishness of preaching? Well, it's because it's the power of God. It's different than teaching. The Bible says that a preacher is called to the foolishness of preaching and apt to teach and I've had a preacher I've had several preachers come up to me and say man you sure got a gift for teaching I said no that's something God has had to develop apt to teach I mean God had to develop that gift and let me tell you something that's still a work in progress amen right and guess what if you can't teach and you think preaching's teaching you're nuts and I tell you, they, they need to get to teaching the Word of God. And this is where uh, people become starved because they aren't taught. Now, we're in verse 20 and 22 here on F underneath Roman numeral 3. And this is the challenge uh, to the Laodiceans. Now, the Lord has already told them a few things, hasn't he? And uh, we've already went over that. I'm not going to go back. I love to. I like it. But uh, the challenge, that word challenge is a calling to fight for. And God is saying here, hey, I've told you all these things. I've let you know uh, the, the, uh, uh, the things that I've counseled you so far. But I want, you to, I want to give you a call to fight. There is, it reminds me of David, I don't know why, every time I see the meaning of that, it reminds me of David, and he looked out and he says, uh, is there not a cause? That's what the Lord says. There is a call to fight, will you fight? Will you fight? Now, the, look under here, the, the only hope for a lukewarm church is to what? Invite Christ to take up his rightful place. 
Now look at verse number 20 of chapter 3 of Revelations. It says, Behold, and that's a, that word is there to wake you up. Hey, this is where I'm at. I stand at the door and what? Knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Now, let's look at the striking challenge that the Lord has for the church. Now, there are seven challenges here in that verse that God wants to give to you. And I, I think this is awesome. And what's interesting is you can uh, write this down. I'm going to give you extra things beside it, okay? So that's what's neat about coming to the assembly, okay? So you're going to get some extra things, not just the notes I'm going to give you. Number one is the petitioner. That's your blank. Now, as we go through these, I'm going to give you your blank. I'm going to define that word, but I want you to see what that means as we go along, okay? So in verse number 20, we see it says, Behold I. That is the petitioner, amen? Uh, whenever I see the Lord say I, it reminds me of him making sure you understand who he is, okay? And here you go. Here's what God gave me. This will preach, friend. Woo, gives me goosebumps. Number one on that, right next to that, here's his challenge. He wants you to know who he is. They didn't know who he was. What's interesting is the petitioner wants you to know who he is. Notice how he states that. Behold I. <laughs> wow. He's the only one. I'm on the outside and I should be on the inside. Now, you, in order to really get a grasp of this, you have to understand what the word petitioner is. What it means. We haven't got too far. Brother Jeff, we're on F number one on, uh, in our notes. We haven't got too far. It's petitioner. And uh, the word petitioner, for those of you, listen to this, it means one that presents. Now, let me tell you something. God sure has presented a lot of things to me. Has he not you? Amen. He presented salvation to me. Amen. And notice how he does it. Behold I. You forgot about me. You sure remembered me at salvation. But then, since then, what happened? What happened? The petitioner means one that presents one. No, now let me, I, I never, I, this is hard for me to fathom. Almighty God, in all of his power, who wants us to know who he is, requests. He gives you opportunity. Let me help you understand something. When we were looking at First Thess or Second Thessalonians two one through three, remember when the Lord comes back, he, there is no request at that point. No request. You know when he comes back on the white horse in that great, Amen. His white robe and his white hair, like sheep's wool. That's what the Bible says. Not flowing and not long. With a crown, of many crowns. With us behind him, because we're not going to do anything but watch. He don't need our help. Didn't need your help to be saved. Didn't need your help to pay for your sins. Didn't need your help. But we're the saints and we follow our Savior and our Lord. And I'm glad we're behind him because at that point he's going to have anger in his eyes and he never looks at the ones he loves with anger. But he's making a request right now. Now remember in chapters 2 and 3 in the very first part of chapter 4 is the church is still here. And so Christ still has requests. And can I tell you, I don't know how long before the rapture, because remember, we already said that we're in that falling away time. We're just waiting for the trumpet. Now, what I've told you, and I believe this with all my heart, the one thing that we're waiting for is the fall of America, which isn't going to take much. We already know how to destroy ourselves. We allow a lot of injustices ourselves. We don't take a stand for things like we should, like we would have before. The church didn't stand for a lot of things that we should have, like the Ten Commandments and prayer, so we just let them come out of school. And no good thing happened after that. Shootings. All kinds of nasty things have happened, haven't they? 
Since they've took the Ten Commandments out of school and prayer out of school, we've had not only more shootings, but more nasty sexual things happen between teacher and student. Hmm. When we remove God, then we open it up to Satan. Now, I'm just trying to help you. The church could have took a stand on that and said, we're not doing it. But remember, the church is you and I. And here we see a church here where God says, I'm on the outside, and here's what I have for you. It's hard to do that, Krim. I'm not at the restaurant. Amen. I have a petition. Now, no matter how, I know it's bad. I know I'm outside, but how hard is it to open the door? Verse 20 in chapter 3 of Revelations, Behold I, that's the petition. The petitioner is on the outside of the church. You know what I find, it's not funny, what I find unusual and awful is that that's where Christ stands outside of most churches. The word petition not only means request or one that presents, but it's a formal, verbal, written petition. Let me help you. God knew that uh, you needed it written down. Most of us need a picture. Huh? Don't we? Well, you know what? God already knew. He wrote it down. We just don't read it. You know, let me tell you something. I've, I've heard all kinds of ways of reading the Bible, but let me tell you, what else, how did you get anything out of that? Uh, I've, seen, uh, I've heard people listen to audiobook. Uh, I've heard people do all kinds of different ways to get the Bible in. And let me help you. There's something that never will, will, you'll never uh, do those types of things and get what God wants you out of that unless you dig. Uh, digging's not listening. Digging is having information given to you because you dug. Huh? If you're looking for uh, 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 metal objects and you go buy one of those, whatever those, what are those called? There you go. You go buy a metal detector. Amen. Well, you're going to go to the park or something. What do you think you're going to find? Coins, rings, necklaces. You're going to think you're rich, right? Amen. Uh, but you know, it took some time. You had to invest money into it. And you know, I found out those aren't cheap, Brother Jim. That's why I never got one, right? Number two, I just don't have enough time to go. Zero, 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 zero. But, uh, and uh, it's pretty silly just to do that for 50 cents, you know. <laughs> you know, if I was going to find some Civil War stuff, that'd be pretty cool, wouldn't it? Amen. But let me tell you something you'll never find the good stuff unless you actually try. Are you with me? I've watched the, uh, what's it called, The Curse of Oak Island. Boy, does that ever stop? If they would study their Bibles as much as they're trying to dig 200 feet under the, an island and for the, so stupid. come on, man. I mean, yeah, it was interesting for a year or two, and I'm like, does this ever get old? Oh, my word. How many millions of dollars that we could have used for the Lord? I mean, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, big deal. You found a stupid cross that goes back to the 1600s or whatever. Who cares? If we would study like that in this, if we would invest in this, this is what he's saying. I'm standing on the outside, and you're investing in your own life and not allowing to be invested in me. And I'm requesting. I've even given you a written petition. And you won't even read it. Now, you know, I remember when me and my wife courted, and uh, we didn't write lots of letters and all that hoopla. You know, I'm just a normal guy. I'll write something, I mean, probably pretty shallow, not too romantic, but romantic for me, Brother Jeff. (laughs) And leave her a little dumb note on her windshield, you know, and then she kept it, of course, and makes me embarrassed with it. Why don't you write me things like that no more? Are you with me? Boy, we'll try to please... At the beginning, remember when you were saved? You felt so great. Oh, I'm going to serve Jesus. What happened? Oh, just too much work, man. Sundays, I got basketball and ice skating and whatever else, skiing. And, you know, I got to go water skiing. And, you know, hey, I've got to get tan. Well, summer's coming up. I hope that every Sunday is cloudy and raining then. 
Praise God. You say, why is that? Because remember, you heard verse Sutton said, the Bible says the Lord's coming in the clouds. Maybe you can be cloudy every Sunday just to remind you that you're at home trying to get suntanned and the Lord's going to come back. He's going to see you there. He already saw you. You'd be just like the disciples. He said, why are you standing gazing? We're supposed to be busy. Number two, remember this is a challenge. This is a call to fight for. And God has given you a petition. He stands, and, and right beside number one, I want you to write this. The petitioner, when he says, Behold I, know who he is. That's what he wants you to know. He wants you to know who he is. Write that right beside number one. That is extra uh, uh, digging there for you, just so you can have that there. It's kind of a neat little outline. Number two, uh, here that verse, number 20, he says, Behold I, and he says, Stand at the door. That is place. You know what's interesting? Write this right next to two. He, not, he wants you to know where he is. He's not hiding. He wants you to know who he is. You know, I've heard a lot of people say, well, I just want to know Jesus. Well, you know what? It's not that, that's not on him. That's on you. I want to know Jesus. Whatever. Well, I pray. Do you read your Bible? No. Do you go to church? No. It's funny because that Jesus you say you want to know says not forsake the assembly of ourselves together. That's pretty funny. I just want to know Jesus, but I don't want to do the things he says. Really? Kind of hard to get to know your wife when you do everything she hates. You know what's funny is a, a spouse normally, because it's give, isn't it? I, it's a give, isn't it? Both sides have got to give. There's things that I like to do that she hates. Some of those things she just has to... Right. Like, I like the top of my dresser a mess, Jeff. I love it. I don't want her messing with that. That is where my T-shirts go, right? That's right. That's where I, and you know what she cleans at? Or if I clean it, I don't know what to do at the, the whole day. I'm, I'm just out of sorts. The Lord wants you to know who he is, and he wants you to know where he is. Notice, he gives you a place. Now, the word place means this. It means a local existence. Huh, because you know what? My God can be everywhere all the time. Now, he's not going to come into your household when you've allowed Satan to come in with your anger. And he can stand right outside your house knocking on that door. You know what? He wants you not only to know him, he wants you to be with him. We like to leave him in the dust. You know what he's telling this church? You left me outside. You don't know me, and I'm not even with you. That's a scary place to be. Number three. This is a word we don't use every day, and I'm going to have to spell it for you. I'm going to have a hard time saying it, and Miss Julia is going to correct me with her proper English. Amen. I'm expecting that. But number three there in that verse says, and knock. Here's your blank. Uh, I think it's. Poignancy, P-O-I-G-N-A-N-C-Y. Did I pronounce that right, Miss Julia? Poignancy. There you go. There, that's right from, from England, right there. Amen. That's where our English came from. Amen. And she's a teacher. The Lord made sure that he brought me an English teacher right off the bat because he knew I butchered the English language for long enough. Amen. <laughs> so you say, well, what is that word? I'm glad you asked. How many knows? Other than Miss Johnson, she probably does. <laughs> Cheater. <laughs> Cheater raised in England. Knows all the words. Amen. Have you, have you used that word, Miss Julia? Okay, good. I'm glad. Yeah. Anybody, anybody got a guess? Just guess. It's not going to. Good job, Brother Jim. Is that what Miss Julia told you? Oh, I was going to say Cheater. <laughs> Listen to this. It's not just that. The first thing I read, does anybody else want to add before I say? Uh, the first thing I read, it, it did say to the point, but it said power. Wow. Jesus has always been to the point. But the most important thing is we don't have power without him in here. We don't have power without knowing him. You know what he's telling that church and ours? If you don't know me, and if I'm not in here, you don't have no power. 
Knocking is an authoritative thing. You know, all these, ah, don't knock, just ring the bell. Ding, ding. Huh? I was always, you know, the cops come to your house and they're trying to get you to, they're going to arrest you. They don't come going, ding, ding. How do they come? Bum, 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 bum. Let me ask you something. You think the Lord's out there going, ding, ding. Because it's the church. I'm supposed to be in there. I bring the power, you don't. I want to know you. I want to be in your place. And I want to bring power. You say, well, preacher, what about your outline? Well, I'm glad you asked. Number one was, he wants you to know who he is. Number two is, he wants, to know, he wants you to know where he is. And number three is, he wants you to know what he is. You say, what do you mean, what he is? Well, he is power. The power of God is the gospel, period, period. The Bible says that the power of God is the gospel. It's no other thing. It's the gospel. What's the gospel? It's the death, burial, and the resurrection of who? Jesus. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. There is nothing more powerful than that. Those churches stop preaching about the blood. The blood, the blood covered it all. Help me. The debt paid in full. He knew from the beginning. And his precious blood covered it all. You know what is interesting? He wants you to know where, who he is, where he is, and he wants you to know his power. You know, you say, I've never felt the power of God. Probably not. And it's because of the fact that we don't really know him. You know, just because you got saved and read a few verses and been to a few devotional classes, and you know what's funny with older people? The older we get, the more we think we already know everything. Now, I want you to understand that, that I posted something on Facebook, and I try to keep it all biblical, uh, but the more I know, the more I, need, I know I need to learn. If you get to that mindset where you think you know everything, then shame on you. You don't. You, you know less. Okay? You need to go back to Jesus. What you've done is you've left him outside, just like this church. If we think we can do church without the Bible, then we've left him outside. If we think we can do church with any other way and any other avenue, then we've left him outside because Jesus gave us an example, a permanent mark on how the church is to be run and it's all about the gospel. It's all about that. Number three, that word means power and to the point. Boy, that's awesome, isn't it? These messages from Christ begin with a church that had left its first love and end with a church that has him outside seeking admission. Number four, verse number 20, it continues. Remember, we're breaking it down in seven points, this one verse. We're down to, uh, uh, if any man hear my voice. So here we see uh, four is the plea, P-L-E-A, that's your blank. The plea. Now, what's a plea? Remember, when you go to court, you gotta, you got to make a plea, don't you? Usually, they only give you two, guilty or not. <laughs> Amen. What, is the, what, do you think the, what do you think plea means? Help me with that. Definitions are all, everything. This is what you're supposed to do at home, by the way. Searching the scriptures is what we're doing. Are you with me? And, and you can't teach what you haven't searched. Let me, let me help you with this. These notes mean nothing unless you search them out. I can't just come up here and read these notes and think I know it. Absolutely wrong. I've tried that in school, Miss Julia. Told me to read a book, and so I just wrote what the summary at the back. Thought I could make it by. Didn't work. I really didn't know the books, the story. The teacher started asking me questions about the story. I, oh, I didn't know that uh, Fred was in there. That's because you didn't read the book. Right? <laughs> yeah, we, I think we all tried that. 
that, that's something teachers already knew. They're like, why did they even put a summary in there in the first place? Amen. <laughs> they do that to sell the book, right, don't they? To intrigue you, but no, us lazy people that didn't really care for reading, now that's what God's called me to do is read. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? Amen. All right, plea. So what does plea mean? It means a cause or a urgent prayer or entreaty. The God of all power is praying for me, is pleading for me, and he's outside of my life, and I'm not in the place that he wants me in, and I don't see the power of God in my life, and he's still pleading for me to allow it. Or Jim knows what that's like. I'm not trying to pick on him, but where Jim just got saved, what, five months ago? Last year? Been a year? Man, whew, time's flying. I'm getting old. <laughs> yeah, pre-COVID. Pre-COVID salvation. That's how we'll date it. Amen. <laughs> but let me, let me ask, Jim, Brother Jim, if you don't mind, did you hear him pleading with you for how many years? How long is he going to plea? The Lord has a cause, an urgent prayer, or an entreaty. If any man hear my voice, that's you. That's, remember, he's not talking about salvation right here, friend. He's talking about being a part of your life. This is a letter to the church. Remember, whenever you say ecclesia, which that would be the word here, that means assembly of born-again, baptized believers that left Jesus outside the church and was acting just like the world. I'm just I'm trying to be honest. The Lord's looking at Christians today, and he's begging to be a part of your life. The plea. The Lord, in the midst of these candlesticks, right underneath number four in your notes, can only dwell within the church. Let's look at these verses. First Corinthians, or yeah, it's First Corinthians three sixteen. First Corinthians three sixteen. I try to read all these verses, but sometimes I get to looking at the notes or the time, and I'm like, oh, I got to hurry. But let's not hurry through here because we're so excited about the rapture. Amen. Uh, if the rapture happens before we get to the rapture, won't that be a great thing? We won't even need to learn it because the Lord will tell us. Amen. <laughs> uh, so for uh, First Corinthians chapter three and verse sixteen, uh, are you there? I want you to see something here, and this is important. We talked a little bit about this uh, because I heard somebody talking about it. But anyways, the Bible says, Know ye not that ye are the what? The temple of God, that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? That's a question. All right, now turn to Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 22. Just over, just past Galatians, Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 22. Are we there? Only Corinda? Everyone else there? Ephesians 2.22. The Bible says, In whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Now, I want you to understand something. Uh, we are builded together. Okay? But... When you get saved, what happens? Acts chapter 1 and verse number 8. The Holy Spirit comes and resides within you. And uh, I'll tell you, when you got saved, you knew that. And he came out and he actually uh, talks to you through a still small voice that we deafen sometimes because we like our sin. Okay, but let me help you. You're not the church. You're the temple of God, but you're not the church because the church has to be builded together. Are you with me? Now, think about this. If we're together, the assembly, which that's what church means, ecclesia, an assembly of born-again, baptized believers, to be builded together, that's what makes the church. So, I could be whatever, the mouthpiece of the church, because I'm the preacher, but you could be the neck. Now, 
This is, I want, I want you to understand something. I am the pastor. I, I am due double honor, like the scripture says. I am due uh, dual, uh, dual respect. I am, due, I am deserved all those things. But I do like you to understand that I'm just like you. I'm a man. But don't forget that the place that God's placed me is a place of respect and honor. But you could be the neck. Now let me ask you this. If I'm the mouth and I don't have a neck, how well can I preach? Because doesn't God call the church the body of Christ? That needs to be builded together. Are you following me? I'm, I'm not doing anything but bringing words to your understanding that the Bible already shows. So when you don't build yourself together with the church, we're missing something. When's the last time you tried to do curls without an elbow, Jeff? Well, how's that work? I have no idea. You don't have an elbow, how, how's your hand stay up, you know? Yeah. Well, what if you don't have an elbow? What if it's just a piece of bone? That's great, isn't it? You can walk around like this, right? You know, it's funny, isn't it? But we don't see it that way. We see I'm my own person. Let me tell you something. I've broken bones and I've had surgery. And I don't really care where you're hurt. When you don't have movement in a certain place, no matter where it is, you don't function. Are you with me? So if you're not in your place, build it together, the body doesn't work properly. Are you following me? Hope you got it. So we're the temple, not that singular. And the church is the church, is the assembly. If you'll, uh, uh, we didn't even look at uh, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 17. I want to turn back over there. Are we still there? Yes, we are. Look at verse 17. It says, if any man defile the temple of God, him shall what? Now, remember, when we're talking about the temple, we're talking about the, our body. So I'm trying to make this applicable for you. What would that mean? If any man defile, now I didn't look that word up, but we know what that means, don't we? You know what, why don't we have a, a day where we just let people come in and do whatever they want in the church, you know, kick the pews over and let's just spray paint where we want to. You know, that's going to bring more people in. You know, if we just put up there with orange spray paint, we love Jesus. Won't that be sweet? We just start doing what we want. Huh? You say, what are you talking about? Well, we'd be defiling the house of God, would we not? This is where we meet. We don't need all the spray paint on there. We're trying to give God honor. And Wait a minute, what about you? What about you? Now, you say, what does this have to do with what we're teaching here in this church? This is what they were doing. They left God on the outside. They didn't know him. They didn't allow him in their place. They didn't see his power, and they didn't listen to his call, plea. And so what they were doing was what they wanted, and the Lord said that he saw that church as of the Laodiceans. And so what he saw was the world. Now, if we were to bring that church to today, what would that church look like? I've already got some eyes and I already got pictures in my head, don't you? Tattoos, gauges, piercings. Let me tell you this. I, I want you to understand. Why don't you go do a study? It, oh, don't make me study. I hated school. Prophets of Baal. Go check them out. Tattoos. Do you know they did burnings? Huh? They did piercings. Did you know that? They were in it. They were called the prophets of what? Well, why didn't Elijah do that? Because he was God's temple. He was the mouthpiece of God. He was not his own. Are you with me? What's the difference between you and Elijah? I'll, let me help you. Not much than the Laodicean church. 
when we start seeing that come into the church and, and, and hey, we bring in the worldly music, we bring in the worldly hairdos, we bring in the worldly look, come on, we bring in the worldly talk. Come on, help me. Come out from among them and be ye what? We're supposed to be Christ-like, not Waxahachie-like. Christ-like. As he allowed dwell within the lives of his people in that church. Amen. Number five. Got to watch the time. Boy, we're getting close. Notice here in verse number 20 of Revelation chapter 3. You can go ahead and turn back there if you would. It says, and... Open the door. So we've already seen the petition, the place, the uh, the poignancy. Did I say that right, Miss Julia? Whoo, praise the Lord. That's a tough one. The plea, the, it's okay to be all right. It's okay to be normal, right? Not everybody can pronounce that word. That's tough. You try to do it all at the same time. There we go. My wife wasn't afraid. All right, so when they have number five, he says, and open the door. You know what that is? That is a proposal. So first the Lord says, hey, I want you to know who I am. Behold I, the petition. Then he says, hey, I stand at the door. He wants you to know where he is, the place. This is where I'm at. Then he goes, hey, and I knock. He goes, hey, I want you to know my power. Then he makes the plea, doesn't he? Ha. He wants you to. He shows the plea of you of of wanting to know him and be with him and see his power. And then we see the Lord, the proposal. Now, does anybody even understand what that word is? I'm, I'm going to jump into this. I'm not going to allow time to answer. But the word proposal, if you'll write next to it, is that which is offered. It is this. This is probably the best part of the whole meaning. Uh, the proposal is an acceptance. Now that is powerful for me. Because when God was doing this to me and I was running from him and he was calling and pleading, he said, I accept you. I know you're a mess. Come on, are you with me? Come on. I know you're a wreck. I'm God. Remember, behold, I. The great I am, I'm outside. I have all power. Please let me in. Child of God, I accepted you long ago. I don't know about you, that's different, isn't it? Why didn't God just bless the door down? Huh, that's not God. Huh? Remember, Jesus calls us his bride. I don't know about you, and I was getting ready to get married. I didn't go bust no doors down unless I didn't want to get married, right, Jeff? All right, man. Man, that's how it's going to be, right? I'm the new sheriff in town. Where, where's your dad at? I got to show him who's the boss. Huh? Yeah. We won't go into that, will we? The Lord loves you. He says, I want you to know me. Not only that, I'm telling you where I'm at. And I'm not with you. I'm pleading. I'm making a request. I want you to know my power, child. Not only that, I want you to understand something. I already know the muck you're in. And I've already accepted that. You know what's neat about that? That's called love in spite of yourself. You say, wait a minute, this church is awful. You know, I, I'm not really, I don't really want to bash churches. I'm not into bashing churches, but I am into showing you where churches are not right. But I don't ever want to list a church and bash it. You let your mind do whatever it wants to do. We're going to stick to the Bible. But God says that he stood outside this church. So there are churches, no matter what you think, God standing outside of them saying, let me in. I don't want to go. I don't want to be there. I want to go where Jesus is at. I want to hear him. Hey, that starts with you. He said, oh, no, preacher, that has all to do with you. No, 
That starts with you, friend. You know, I've uh, I've uh, known a lot of preachers in my life, and they, a lot of preachers they'll get up there and they'll say, "Now, don't come tell me all the bad things that happen on the way to church right before I get up there and preach." That's actually good advice. Because, you know, preachers are trying to get prayed up and Satan's trying to attack them because he knows that the preacher's going to get up there and if, uh, if uh, he can stop him in any way of having the illumination of Scripture or having some kind of doubt in his mind, uh, then he'll stop the Holy Spirit of God from moving and touching your life. And that's exactly what he wants to do. But you know what I see here when I think about that? I see the Lord looks down. He's looking from outside, from the outside in. And I love that part of him. And I'm so glad he accepted me, even though I was such a stubborn fool. And I can't believe he let me run for so long. And I noticed I said, let me. He let me run. Not only did he let me run, he watched me run. Just like he did here. And here's his challenges, child of God. Here's a personal challenge for you. Just on these, uh, uh, on these uh, uh, few, five, he wants you to know him. Do you know him? Really? Do you really know him personally? He wants that. Number two, he wants you to know not only him, but he wants you to know where he is. He wants you to know his power, number three. Number four, he wants you to know how he is. You say, oh wow, what he is, where he is, what he is. He wants you to know how he is. When I see the plea, the reason why I put that one on number four is because when he pleads, that shows us his character of compassion. He's calling, not busting the door down. Number five, we see, uh, no, he wants us to know that he's a giver. The giver that he is. Isn't that amazing? What a giver. You say, how is the Lord, how does that show that the Lord's a giver, the proposal? Real quick, and we're going to close. Because he accepted you. He doesn't have to accept you. That's a lot of give if you wouldn't accept. Come on. Let me, I'll help you with an, with an explanation. My wife doesn't have to allow me to have a junky uh, dresser. She gives me that. Thank you. And she doesn't get mad about it anymore. She just lets me build it up like a big old mountain. That's sweet, man. You have to come check it out. She gets so mad if I let you. She lets you. She'd probably be so mad. She goes, don't you let him see your filth. Amen. I'm teasing. Huh? It's not that bad. It's not that bad. Now everybody on the internet is like, oh, my word. Pastor Worley has a messy drawer. Amen. Uh, but let me tell you something. That has a lot to do with giving. Right. It does, doesn't it? I understand where you're at, but until you get to know who I am, where I am, and all the others, then I will help you change. Okay? That's the one thing that's different than my wife. God can change me. She can't. Are you with me? My husband and my spouse and my kids can't change me. God can. But what's interesting how he does it. He allows you to accept him in your life. And as you do that, he begins to change you from the inside out. And things that you never thought you would do, you begin to do. Isn't that great? Praise the Lord. We'll start on number six next Wednesday. Let's all stand and close in a word of prayer. Praise the Lord for that.